Hi there everyone, Lars here with another Amphibia review brought to you by Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And oh boy, we got some good fun episodes this past weekend right here with Newts and Tights and Fight or Flight. These two episodes, man, these were just great fun to watch. Nothing really too heavy, and yet, very, very important things going on here in these episodes. I saw a comment from another YouTuber saying, well, there was nothing important to the plot that happened, but these were fun to watch. Allow me to disagree with the first part, but definitely agree with the second. These episodes were a blast to watch. Really funny, definitely rewatchable, and I recommend that if you haven't watched these yet, what are you doing here? Shut down this video and go watch Amphibia. It is amazing. But for those of you who have seen it or who are just interested in knowing what I have to say about it and what we can learn from it as novice writers, let us proceed. Now then, it's really easy, really, to sum up the stories for these two episodes. Starting off first with Newts and Tights, Anne and Sprig meet their old mentor slash babysitter, uh, Tritonio, which <laughs> I'm so happy that we got to see this guy again right here. Uh, this scallywag was definitely a highlight to season one with the way that he taught Anne and helped Anne realize that her teachers weren't out to get her, but maybe that she just really had a miscommunication problem going on right there which is important to Anne's development as a character because yeah there was a lot of miscommunication in season one that engendered a lot of the toxic relationships that were pulling Anne back and weirdly enough this con man allowed Anne to see that and to better herself as an individual, as well as hone the skills that she had already been developing at home, having fun just doing swashbuckling stuff with her parents, but now she is a true swordsman. And we get to see how this whole thing comes full circle, where she now can help Tritonio realize that, hey, you might still be a con man and a scallywag, but you know what? Even you deserve a place. Even you deserve to have friends and family. Even you can overcome miscommunication problems and have healthy relationships. And that's what they get at the end by helping him to regain his band of merry men, of merry newts, with their fantastic tights, and become heroes. And, of course, join the rebellion against King Andreas. In the second episode, Fight or Flight, or Fight and Flight, <laughs> and gets to meet Domino 2 all over again. This is sweet. I didn't think that we would ever see this crazy moth again, this coastal killer, but there she is. And she's got a whole litter of cute little caterpillars, those dangerous little things. This was just, this was a really funny episode. It was great to see how all of the frogs, including dog lover Sasha, just fell for these little caterpillars. It's true. If you let a kitten into your house or into your heart, there's no way you're ever going to give her up. But here we have Anne going to save Domino 2 alongside with Sprig. I love how Sprig is like, this is a horrible idea, but sticks with Anne the entire way through. And they go, they rescue Domino 2 in a beautiful flight of the moth, which I love that a lot of people have been pointing out how this has has a fantastic um, link to when we got to see uh, Sprig perform for uh, Amphibia's Got Talent, and we get to see that music come back. But this, <laughs> this time, Sprig is really uh, not the star of the show. Instead, he is the food. But yeah, all's well that ends well. Anne and Sprig managed to save Domino 2, and in good old How to Train Your Dragon style, not only has Anne tamed the beast, but this beast just happens to be the alpha that will call all of the other coastal killers to her call and tame them all for the frogs to use. And now the rebellion has air power, and really everything has fallen into line. 
This is why I disagree that these episodes are not plot important. Because not only are these episodes fulfilling certain things that were important back in season one, and again still keeping to the theme of toxic versus healthy relationships, but now we have brought together all three races. Frogs, Toads, and Newts, who will all be coming together in the upcoming episode, The Three Armies, in order to prepare to fight against King Andreas. And with the coastal killers now on their side, they have necessary air power to get up to Andreas's castle and bring the fight directly to him. No longer can Andreas dictate the terms of this war. So things are progressing along very, very importantly. And having Tritonio on their side means that he and Sasha can bring their brains together and form the right kind of strategy that utilizes the strengths of all three species, bringing them together to take on this seemingly impossible to defeat army. However, that's not all that there is. These two episodes actually fall in line with something that I noticed going back to the root of evil, where we saw how even a horrible person like Apothecary Gary can be given a moment of redemption and be brought into the fold of the good guys. Because yeah, war makes strange bedfellows. And what we see right here is we see redemption for Tritonio and we see redemption for Domino 2. And this is really, really interesting right here because all of these different redemptive arcs that, are, that we see right here within the series also sandwich the story of Andreas and how he became a villain. And what we see is that Andreas was originally a good newt. He was a good prince, but it was the toxic relationship that he had with his father that turned him evil. So the question is, can he be redeemed? That was the big question that I posed in my last review. And what we see in these episodes is yes. If all of these other characters can be redeemed, why can't he? But not only that, we also see that the planters finally got into Leaf's old room. And there's a lot of just great stuff in this quick moment, it's not just simply, hey, they found Leaf's old room. We have now confirmed that Leaf is part of the planter line, but we also see something really great right here that the P for planter was originally the L for Leaf. That I think is really cool because of the way that the cursive goes and everything like that. That is just really, really neat. It's not something that is explained there in the episode, but it's there for you to catch. And that's really cool. That is a strength of visual storytelling. So we have confirmation that Leaf indeed is connected to the planters and not just by skin hue or by the dance, but there it is. There her uh, room is in the catacombs of the planter family. And when they got in, Sprig found a note, a blank note. And it's the same kind of note that she would have given to Andreas. And it's sealed and prepared and everything. It's obviously there to be found. The idea being that this is a note that was meant very likely for Andreas. And Sprig took the note. Yes! I was correct. I was right when I said that who is the one who is going to help Andreas turn around? It would be Sprig. Not the way I originally thought, but there it is. Sprig took the note. Sprig has the note on his person. And in the battle that is to come, it is very likely that that note is going to get to Andreas. What is it going to say? I don't know. But whatever is there will give Andreas a moment to choose if he's going to go through with the plans that his father and the core have put into motion or if he will finally step back and be the newt that he was always supposed to be. So the choice is there, the possibility is there for Andreas to be redeemed. It's just all going to come down to his decision. And that's going to be very, very interesting to see because he is a character who has chosen multiple times to do the wrong thing. He knows it's the wrong thing, but he has done it because he wants that validation. He wants his father to love him. He wants to restore Newtopia to its ancient glory. He wants to live up to what he believed he was supposed to do. 
So because of all of those things, he's always consistently made the wrong choice. Could he now, a thousand years later, finally, finally listen to his old friend Leaf and make the, make the right decision? We're going to see. That's going to be really, really interesting. However, there's still even more that we should consider given current events that are happening within the show. So we know that the upcoming final battle is nigh, and Disney has released a new poster for said finale. And holy cow, do we get some amazing connections and potentially also some world crossover stuff happening right there in front of us. Look at the center of this poster, and we see a massive machine behind Marcy, or Darcy, I should say. That massive machine behind Darcy, we've already seen it in the background. It was there when Andreas was chasing Leaf as she was running away with the Calamity Box. It was there in the background. I thought that this was actually the plans for a some sort of prototype or what have you, or an incomplete robot, and yet we see right here that it is indeed complete. Wow, this machine right here, this thing has been planned for a thousand years to be unleashed on Earth. But also, I want you guys to pay attention to it. Doesn't this look a little bit familiar? Here's the thing, I'm going to be very honest. When I saw this bad boy in the background of the core and the king, I was like, wait a second. I had to rewind, pause, and be like, I think I've seen that guy before. I had to go back to the Owl House, and sure enough... There's a crazy resemblance to King's Guards right here. Now then, is this confirmation that the Newts went to the Boiling Isles, encountered these things, studied them, and then turned them into a massive robot? Potentially, we'll find out. Or it could also be that the horns right there are meant to mimic what we think of when it comes to Vikings because they would be invading Earth around the time of the Vikings. And again, when we look back to the vase that captures the moment that Leif went to Earth, she is standing before the Vikings. So it is possible that this machine is meant to be a kind of Viking robot that was meant to be unleashed on Earth and demolish humanity, commit genocide, or this is a replica of the crazy uh, creatures that were there to defend King. So this is, an, this is some interesting speculation right here. When I look at this machine, I can't help but think that it looks way too similar to other things that we've seen. It doesn't look anything like any of the frogs or toads or newts that we have seen before. This is very, very different. And I'm really interested in finding out hopefully why that is. And one more thing that I just really want to highlight right here. I love how Anne and Sprigg's relationship is just so strong by this point within the series. They are absolutely perfectly in lockstep to do all the things that need to be done to help the heroes along. This is the example of what a good, healthy, strong friendship should be like. Again, this is holding firm and true to the heart of what Amphibia is all about. It is all about healthy relationships. So... This is just honestly brilliant. There's a whole lot that is happening here in these episodes. It's not just fun fluff before the finale. All of it is very important, dropping clues and hints to what's to come, as well as building up the armies and the people ready to go fight against King Andreas and against the core. Now, because this is a channel all about writing for novice writers, well, what can we learn from this right here? There's actually a whole lot that you can learn from these episodes. Number one, sticking to your themes even this late in the game really pays off. There's a lot of authors out there who, when they reach a certain point, they're like, I have made my message. I am done with it now. I'm going to move on. When you do that, it's very easy to lose the heart of your story because you had incorporated certain themes early on. And then when you reach a moment where you're like, yes, I have made my point. If you just drop it and then continue on with your story, your story will lose a certain part of itself. It will lose a very important 
essence to it. So you need to make sure that you're always keeping in with the themes that you established from the beginning. And you can tell, even with professional writers, when they decided to drop a certain idea. And it feels like an important part of the story is missing. Secondly, yes, learn how to write military encounters. There's a whole lot of silly stuff happening in these two episodes, and yet it all makes military sense. For instance, air power. Air power is essential in modern warfare, and the toads, the newts, and the frogs were stuck in a certain position because, well, they're on the ground. Sure, they've got all the Mad Max Fury Road stuff going, yeah! But without air power, there's only so much they can do to actually hurt Andreas, who has domination of the skies. This is an important element to know within modern warfare. And this is just casually slipped on in, and yet it makes total sense. You have to know some aspects of warfare if you're going to write a, a logical and honestly comprehensible battle within your stories. Lastly, I want to talk about how we as writers can use visual storytelling. However, with our words, because this is definitely a strength that cartoons or movies, what have you, have over written word, where you can see these details. For instance, like how leaf was flipped around to become a P and that's how we get planter. Well, how exactly can you replicate that in your story? What you need to do is this. If you want to have neat little visual clues within your story, what you want to do is you don't want to dedicate an entire paragraph to one obvious thing. Instead, you slip these details on in. So like if this were written right here, you'd say something to the effect of, Anne and the planters approach the corroding door or with a golden pea he, uh, tapped into the door. As they inspected it and saw the slot, Anne noticed the strange after image that was in, that was in the wood. Well, they were too busy wondering how to open up the door, or Hop Hop quickly ran off to get the to get the tome of the family and slid on in, opening up the door, and then we get into the room. With that after image right there, people might be wondering, well, what's what's all of that about? And then with the description of what's there in the room and of the blank note written on pink paper, the 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 eagle-eyed reader will then realize, oh. Oh, that P, that weird afterwards, that's supposed to be an L for a leaf. Whoa, not everyone is going to get it right away. And in fact, that's actually okay. Many times we as authors, we dumb things down because we want everyone to catch what we're setting up. But the thing is this, is that when you do it that way, you dumb down the brilliance of what you just did. Instead, stick to your guns, slip those clues in, make them just part of the casual description of what is happening there in the scene and allow readers to discover the clues that you've hidden in plain sight because when they come to realize what's actually going on they will be rewarded for their dedication to your story and it will make them love you what you have written even more so that's everything I have to say here about these episodes, and I am honestly surprised I've gone on this long. I thought this would be a quick review, but again, there is so much going on in Amphibia right now. We are coming to the end game, and man, it has been brilliantly set up. I'm so excited for the next episodes. I hope you guys are as well. So until the next video, y'all, thank you for joining us on this adventure that we call writing, and tschüss.